Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. We've read these verses almost every study that we've had so far in this series. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, what we did with that verse is we applied the principles gleaned from that verse to the Bible and sought to identify where in the Scripture has God dealt with mankind on the basis of that distinction. Okay, We went all the way back to Genesis. We came all the way through an overview form. We saw that God started dealing with the, with the circumcision as a group with Abraham, that God calls out Abraham, that he commits in a covenant promise to Abraham, a land, a people, and a blessing, and so forth. He gives him the right of circumcision in Genesis 17. And then a lot of other things happen throughout the Old Testament. And we've said that the time passed, God's dealing with the world on the basis of that distinction, ended in Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen and the rejection of the offer of the kingdom made during the early Acts period by the twelve apostles to the nation of Israel as they were empowered by the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. Now, I just said like five sentences and gave you a whole bunch of doctrine in five sentences. Okay, If you don't know what any of that is, you're going to want to go back and look at the previous studies. They are all available for free, as I've said, on the internet. So we've understood time passed. Then we looked at the next verse, next verse in the passage. I'm not going to read all of them for the sake of time. But verse 13 establishes a contrast. He says, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So did there come a time in God's dealing with man where he dealt with them differently from the way he dealt with them in time past? Okay, Time past, if you look over here at the chart, again, is this distinction between Israel, that's nigh unto God, the covenants, the promises, everything is given to the nation of Israel. The Gentiles are without hope and without God, and they are strangers from the covenants of promise, as the passage says. And then Paul says, but now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So the but now time period, as we've studied, is where the time past distinctions are removed. Okay, And God deals with the whole world without distinction. He no longer, in this dispensation, sees a difference between Jew and Gentile, and that is the primary mechanism upon which the body of Christ can be formed. If God is going to reconcile both Jew and Gentile equally in Ephesians 2, uh, look at verse 16, and that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, if He's going to be able to do that, it's going to be on the basis of the fact that there's no longer any what? Any difference between Jew and Gentile. Okay, So we've gone over that information. Look with me now to verse 7. So we've looked at the past, time past. We've looked at the period that we are now members of, the dispensation of grace, the but now time period in this passage, the, the, the time in which the revelation of the mystery has been made known and revealed to and through the Apostle Paul, the time where, where, where God is forming the church, the body of Christ, as distinct from the nation of Israel, the time where he's forming his, the heavenly agency that he is going to use to repossess the heavenly places back unto himself. We looked at how he's going to use Israel in the earth to repossess the earthly uh, authorities uh, under, under uh, his domain through the instrumentality of the nation of Israel. And then you come down here and he talks in verse 17 about the ages what? To come. Now look at, that, look, look at verse um, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Now, verse 6. Verse 6 is talking about you and I, right? Are you today, if you're a member of the church, the body of Christ, are you seated together with Christ in heavenly places? Have you been quickened? Have you been made alive? Are you seated with Him there now, today as a member of the church, the body of Christ? That's what, that's what it says in verse 6, right? Even Verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with who? With Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath, past tense, raised us up how? Together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in who? So, is your heavenly destiny already determined by virtue of the fact that you are in the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay, Paul says that you're as good as seated with him positionally where? When? 
now. Okay? Now, look at the next verse. What's, verse, what's the first word of verse 7? That. That's going to tell you the purpose and the intent. Why have you been seated with Him in the heavenly places now? That in the ages, what? To come. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, I want to, I want to say something here about the expression, ages to come. In this particular passage, is Paul talking about something that God is going to do with respect to us in the ages to come? We use the expression ages to come here because it demonstrates that is there more yet that lies in the future with respect to the plan and purpose of God? Yes, okay? And I want you to also notice ages to come. Is the ages singular or plural? It's plural. Which means there's going to be more than one what? Age in eternity. There's going to be more than one age that yet lies in the future that is yet to come. So the expression ages to come, as Paul's using it in this particular passage, yes, it has its, it has its most pertinent contextual meaning here to something he's stating specific to what he's going to do for the body of Christ in the future, but what it's telling us is that is God going to be done with His dealings with us when this dispensation comes to an end, or is there more things that yet lie out there in the future that are yet to be done? Okay? Now, just think about verse 7 just for us, from our point of view, just for one minute, please. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His what? Grace. And... Sorry, in His kindness toward us, through who? You ever thought about that verse? That's an interesting verse. Imagine being in, you know, I don't know what you think about eternity. People have all kinds of ideas about what eternity is going to be like. But he says, is he says there in that verse that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace. So throughout all of the ages to come, in each age, he's going to show you something about his, the exceeding riches of his what? Grace. It's almost like, you see that age? That age was nothing. Wait till what I show you in this one. Okay. So the expression, ages to come. Is it a future tense expression? Yes. When he uses it here specifically, is he talking about something that pertains to us as members of the church, the body of Christ? Yes, it does. But we can use the expression to as a way of stating the fact that there are future things that yet are to come that God intends to what? Do. Some of them pertain to us as members of the body of Christ, and some of them pertain to who? Israel and His plans and purposes with the nation of Israel. Included in the ages to come is what Ephesians 1.10 talks about when it says in the dispensation of the fullness of times. God's going to gather together all things in one, uh, verse, uh, verse 10, then a dispensation of fullness of times, He might gather to one, together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in Him. We've talked about that already as well. So, come back with me to Romans chapter 8. Last Sunday, we were talking about the ending of the dispensation of grace and the transition into the ages to come, into God returning to deal with this prophetic nation, the nation of Israel. Okay? And we studied some things here in Romans chapter 8 that I'm not going to review here because for the sake of time I want to move on from them. But I want to start with you in verse, um, start at verse 25. Romans 8, 25. He says, actually I want verse 20, I don't want Romans 8 at all. I want Romans 11. Romans 11, 25. <laughs> Romans eleven twenty five. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this what? This mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to who? Folks, is there any doubt that Israel right now as a nation is in a state of temporary blindness? There's no doubt. Okay? But Paul says here in verse 25 that that blindness is in what? It's in part. In other words, is it, is it definite that Israel will always be in this condition? No, read the verse. 
For I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened unto Israel. What's the next word? Until. So the blindness that Israel is in right now is in part. They're going to remain in that situation. What's the next word? Until. So it, will there be a time when the blindness that Israel is in in this dispensation will be lifted from them? Yes. And it says, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So as long as God is offering the Gentiles, Jew and Gentile alike, hasn't he, when He sets Israel aside, remember, He concludes her in unbelief along with the Gentiles. So as long as God is offering salvation to the world without distinction in this dispensation, can we say that Israel is in a state of temporary blindness? When the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, then will the blindness be, that's, that's currently on Israel be lifted according to the verse. So they're, they're in blindness. It's happened in part to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And we talked about that last Sunday as it relates to the catching up of the church, the body of Christ, the, remover, the removing of the restrainer, the removing of the one that withholdeth, the one that letteth, so to make way then for the manifestation of the man of sin. We talked about all that stuff last Sunday as well as the Sunday before. So if you miss that information, you really are going to need to go back and get that stuff. But now watch verse 25. So in verse 25, Israel's in, Israel is blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, what's going to happen to Israel's temporary blindness? It'll be removed, right? Look at the next verse. And so all Israel shall be what? So in other words, when God is done dealing with the world the way He's dealing with the world in this dispensation, and He ends the dispensation of grace, and He catches up the church, and He takes us out of the way, and so forth, and, we, and, and, he's, and He returns back to dealing with Israel according to the prophetic Scripture here, is Israel going to be saved? Verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and he shall turn away ungodliness for Jacob. Now watch verse 27. For this is my what? My what? Folks, is God a man that he should lie? No. Did God in time past make covenanted promises with Israel? Yes. Have all of those covenanted promises that he made to Israel come to pass? No. Why not? You know the answer to that. The reason they have not is because them that God rendered them in unbelief so that He could form the church, the body of Christ, reveal the mystery of the Apostle Paul. Right? So when the church is caught up to meet the Lord in the air and taken out of the way, is there still a bunch of stuff back there from the prophetic Scriptures that God still has to bring to pass as it pertains to the nation of Israel? Are you guys following that? Okay? So when He's... When you're following Romans 11, and you get to verse 25, and he talks about that them being in part, them being blinded in part, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Well, when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, the temporary blindness that Israel's in is going to be lifted, and then you're going to have verse 26, where the issue is going to be all Israel being what? Saved. You following that? Verse 26, and so all, I'm getting ahead of myself. And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written. Notice he says, as it is what? Now why can he do that? Because he's now going back to the prophetic scriptures and he's saying, you see these things over here about the nation of Israel? They must come to pass because it's what? God is not a man that he should lie. If God doesn't fulfill the covenant promises that he made with Israel, is he any different than you and I? No. There shall come out of Zion and deliver us, shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall do what? When does Israel have their sin taken away? Has the sin been paid for? Has the great day of Israel's atonement arrived yet? No. Okay? So all of that stuff... Is, is, is all that stuff is promised and predicted in time past, right? 
But now, in the dispensation of grace, that stuff is temporarily suspended and placed on hold because of Israel's unbelief and them being rendered and them being concluded in unbelief along with the Gentiles and God dealing with the world where there's no what? No difference. Well, when he's done executing that program, does he still have all that stuff back there that he promised him in time past that he needs to fulfill? When's that going to happen? In time past, but now, or in the ages to come. Okay? Now, the ages to come is the focus of Hebrews through Revelation. The ages to come is the focus of Hebrews through Revelation. If you just look, I'm holding off writing some stuff up here till the end because I, I, I don't want to have too much up there and then not be able to do what I want. But if you look over here at the chart <coughs> that's on the wall, you have time past. You have Genesis through Malachi, the Old Testament. The prophetic program, the kingdom is promised to the nation of Israel. Then you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have the gospel of the kingdom being preached. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom that's prophesied back here is said to be at hand. Then you enter into the early Acts period in here. During, between Acts 2 through 7, the Holy Spirit comes upon them on the day of Pentecost and powers them to go out and offer the kingdom to the nation of Israel. And the nation says what? No. So as a result, God sets the nation of Israel aside. He saves Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Israel falls and is diminished throughout the rest of the Acts period here. And Paul reveals the truth about the mystery of the church, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace. And that is recorded in Romans through Philemon. The church is caught up to meet the Lord in the air at the rapture. We're up here in the heavenly places, into the ages to come. And now do you what's left in your Bible? Hebrews through what? Hebrews through Revelation. The ages to come, folks, particularly as it relates to the nation of Israel, is the main subject and the final stage of Israel's prophetic program. The execution of what he promised them back there is going to come to pass in the next time, in the ages to come, after he ends the dispensation of grace and his dealings with the church, the body of Christ. What Hebrews through Revelation do for that believing remnant during that time period is they're designed to educate them into an understanding of what is going on and what God is seeking to accomplish while uh, with that group of people that's going to be alive and live through those events. Now, Israel's need for instructions contained in these books was anticipated by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Come with me to John chapter 14. Come over to John chapter 14. Now, as you're turning there, I better get it before I start talking. Hebrews through Revelation. The book of Hebrews, the authorship of the book of Hebrews has been disputed for time and eternity. Okay? I'm just going to tell you that I, I don't think Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Okay? If you think he did, that's your prerogative. I'm not going to be upset with you. It's my opinion that he didn't. Okay? Hebrews, what's after Hebrews? James. Is James, in the Acts period, one of the leaders of the little flock church? Yes. So you have Hebrews, James, first and second Peter. Who's Peter? Is Peter one of the leaders of the little flock? Yes. Then you have first, second, and third John, is John one of the twelve? Yeah. And then you have Jude, very short book, 25 verses, who is also fits in there related to those guys that are uh, laboring under the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ while he's on earth. And then you have the book of Revelation, who wrote that? John. So you should start to see right off the bat that the writers of those books are the writers of those books men that had affiliations with the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry? Are they some of the very men who in Matthew 10 were told not to go to the Gentiles and in any city of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Yes. So these are men whose entire life and ministry has been associated and affiliated with what group? Israel. Okay? John chapter 14, verse 25. John 14 Verse 25, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, 
He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have what? So is there more information that that little flock is going to need in the time to come than just what the Lord told them in His earthly ministry? And one of the primary functions of the Holy Spirit is to make sure that they not only remember what the Lord told them while He was on earth, but to also tell them and help them understand this additional what? Information. Come with me to chapter 16, look at verse 12. He says, I, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot what? Was there more stuff that the Lord in His earthly ministry wanted to tell them that He perceived they couldn't handle? Verse 13, How be it, but when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall speak not of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to what? To come. So, however you want to understand those, a couple things are clear. Number one, were there things Christ wanted to tell him that he didn't? It's one of the primary functions of the Holy Spirit coming up, them being given the Holy Spirit to help them and to teach them things that he perceived they were not yet ready to understand that they're going to need to know. And notice at the end of at the verse that the things that he's going to that he's going to show them pertain to things that are to what? To come. Now, Come with me. I have Daniel up there. What, let's just go look at it. Go to Daniel 12. It's going to come back up later. Go to Daniel 12. Folks, as we, go, as we, ter, as we begin to talk about the ages to come, I have, I have a few hesitancies, and one of those hesitancies that I have re, sort of resol, revolves around the idea that there's way too much um, prophecy reading going on in our day. In other words, I get the Grand Rapids Press on Sunday and I read the headlines, and I go to my Bible and I go to the prophetic scriptures and I say, Aha. That thing over there happened right now in Lebanon, that's this verse right here. And that thing over there going on in Gaza, that's this verse right here. And that thing going on over there in Israel, that's this verse right here. And this thing going on in Washington, D.C., that's this thing right here. Okay? That's not what we're about. Okay? Because we understand that the prophetic scriptures were given to who? Israel. That the mystery, the body of truth committed to, for, to and for us as members of the body of Christ is unsearchable, it is unknown, it was unrevealed until God revealed it to who? So we're not going to be doing a bunch of prophetic date setting and trying to identify who the Antichrist is going to be tomorrow. Okay? But you understand that when you start talking about prophecy, there's an enticing aspect to that, that people want to know things and they get all jacked up and juiced up trying to figure stuff out. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that there's certain things that you can't understand, because I believe that there are. But what I want to say is I want to caution you against that sort of thing. Plus, the prophetic scriptures themselves will tell you, if you pay attention, that there are aspects to them that are probably going to be difficult to be understood until the time arrives that the things predicted are going to be occurring within. Do you understand what I'm saying? Daniel chapter 12, look at verse 4. Now, Daniel 12 is the last chapter of the book of Daniel. Verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of what? The end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be what? Increased. What that tells me, at least in part, or what I want to caution you about in part as we talk about the ages to come, is to be, don't be overzealous to identify who's fulfilling what prophetic passages. Because we are living in an unprophesied age. 
right? So how many people have made shipwreck of things by trying to predict the rapture, trying to identify the Antichrist, trying to point out who so-and-so is going to be, and none of them up to this point, not a single one of them has been what? Has been true. So we should not think that we're going to have it all, that we're going to be able to do something that, number one, we're incapable of doing, or that, number two, people before us have tried to do and failed. Okay? We understand that? But the idea is that the emphasis in Hebrews through Revelation, okay, is a, is a, is a returning to Israel and the fulfillment of God's earthly program and, pro, and prophetic program with and to the nation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit, one of His functions is going to be, according to the Lord in the book of John, is to help them and teach them these things that He perceived that they were not yet ready to understand. Now, come with me if you would to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Now, I don't know what it is about the book of Hebrews, but it seems like a lot of people come to Hebrews and they lose their mind. Okay? What is the name of the book? What should that tell you? That should tell you that the content of the book is directly related to who? To Hebrews. Who are the Hebrews? The seed of Abraham. Okay? Then when you start to read Hebrews, you see right away that Hebrews fits into a prophetic context and is dealing with people that have a history of God operating with them in a particular way. Okay, Look with me, if you would, at Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake when? Hmm. Unto who? So, the writer of Hebrews is right away, before you even get out of the first verse, is he calling his readership's attention to things that were spoken of in time past? Look at what it says. God at sundry times in a diverse manner spoke in time past unto who? Unto the fathers. How's the verse end? By the what? So now I have a question. Who did he speak to by the prophets? Israel. Okay? So Hebrews 1.1 tells you that whoever is writing and whoever is being addressed, the group of people has a context, they have a history of God speaking to them, and the way and manner that God spoke to them was to the fathers by the what? By the prophets. Now, does that sound like the church, the body of Christ? Who does that sound like? That sounds like Israel. Do we know that God had a prophetic history in dealing with Israel in that exact manner? Okay? The people to whom the book is addressed have a history in their prophetic dealings with God. Hold your hand there and go to Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> Romans 15 verse 8. Paul says about Christ, Now I say Jesus Christ was a minister of who? Okay, why was he a minister of the circumcision? He was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto who? What did the Lord Jesus Christ do in his earthly ministry? He confirmed the prophetic scriptures to the nation of Israel. Right? Hebrews opens up and the very first verse tells you and broad draws the reader's attention to the fact that God in sundry times and diverse manners spoke in time past unto who? Unto the fathers, by how? Now if you look at Romans 8, it says, Now I'd say Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Who were the covenants of promise made with? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 says that the Gentiles in time past were strangers from the covenants of what? Of promise. Now here's the Lord Jesus Christ coming in His earthly ministry, and Paul says He came to confirm the promises made unto who? The fathers. So in other words, everything Christ does in His earthly ministry is it fulfilling the prophetic scripture given to the nation of Israel. 
Yes. And now you come over to the book of Hebrews, the first book in your Bible after the Pauline epistles, and the very first thing you encounter is your attention being drawn to things that God said in time past unto the fathers by how? The prophets. And Paul says that the mystery that he was speaking forth was unsearchable. Is there a difference? Okay. Now, uh, go to Acts 2. Actually, uh, get, grab Acts 2, but before we read the verse in Acts 2, I want to read the next verse in Hebrews. Get Acts 2 in one hand and Hebrews 1 in the other. <coughs> I want, go, go back to Hebrews 1 first. So we got verse 1, God who had sundry times in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath, hath, in these last, what? Days, spoken unto us by His, what? Son. In time past, were the prophets speaking to the Gentiles? No, they were speaking to who? Israel, right? He says in verse 2, "...hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom He made the world." Notice that this is being written, that the book of Hebrews is being written in a time period that the author calls the last what? Days. You see that? So, and in the previous verse, he just spoke of the prophetic Scriptures and God speaking to the, to the fathers by the prophetic Scriptures. And then you come to this verse and he talks about, hath, hath in these last days spoken unto who? Us, whoever he's addressing the epistle to, by his what? So the people that he's talking to directly here are people that heard the Lord teach in his earthly what? Ministry. Because they had been spoken unto in, last, in these last days by his what? By his son. Come over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 16. You remember that they speak in tongues for the first time on the day of Pentecost, and the people think they're drunken and so forth. And, and Peter says in verse 16, he says, in verse 15, he says, These aren't drunken, <clears throat> as you suppose, seeing as of the third hour, hour of the day. Verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by who? By who? The prophet Joel. Okay, and verse 17, And it shall come to pass when? What? Now, last days of what? Last days of prophecy, because Peter's saying that the thing that's going on right there in their midst is what Joel, the prophet, talked about would happen when? In the last days. So whoever the author of Hebrews is, and whoever that author is addressing, he is addressing a group of people that has a historical context in being spoken to by God the Father in sundry and various ways in time past by the prophets, and now more recently in the last days by God the Son. The author of Hebrews is speaking to Hebrews. He is speaking to a group of people that has a historical context in God dealing with them and speaking with them and handling them in a particular way. Come with me if you would. To Hebrews, you know, so you, you noodle around with that. Because on the day of Pentecost on Acts 2, I'll draw this up here, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, so you have the crucifixion of Christ, here uh, on the cross, you have the Lord's ascension into heaven in Acts 1. In Acts 2, you have the, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles. And Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet who? And he says, and he says in these last what? 
days. Okay? So is Peter telling his audience on the day of Pentecost, when he quotes from the book of Joel, and he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that the thing happening right here is the beginning, or has something to do with the last days that the prophet Joel spoke about. And then you come over to the book of Hebrews, and the very first thing you encounter in the book of Hebrews is a group of people being addressed who have a prophetic history in God's dealing with them, and them being spoken to by God the Son in a time period called what? The last days. Now you do the math, that tells me that, that what I conclude from that is that the book of Hebrews is written probably at some point within this time period of Acts 2 and following. Because he's dealing with people that have a what? Maybe it's written later, I can't say for sure. Okay, so don't hold me to that. But the bottom line is, are they talking about the same thing? Come over to Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect, if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that what? Heard Him. Was there a generation of believers? Now, whoever he's writing to, were they alive to hear the Lord teach Himself? How do you know that? Look at the next verse. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His own what? Will. The people here have a context. They saw the Lord teach in His earthly ministry. They witnessed the signs, wonders, diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit that continued on throughout the early Acts period. They are a group that has a context in God dealing with them in a very certain specific way. The context of the book is the earthly ministry of Christ. The salvation spoken of here was first spoken by the Lord, and then it was what? Now, you already know the verses. We've already studied them, right? The Lord went out, the, the, the uh, gospel writer says, preaching and what? Showing the kingdom of God. He preached it, and He showed it and demonstrated that it was there in reality and at hand through the diverse miracles and wonders and signs and gifts of the Holy what? Spirit. Now look at verse 5. Okay, we already went over all that. Hebrews 2.5. For unto the angels he hath not put in subjection the world, he hath not put in subjection the world to what? To come. Whereof we what? Now, did you read in John that the Holy Spirit would be given to him and that he was going to talk to them about things to come? Things that were to come. Now you're reading the book of Hebrews, and the people in verses 3 and 4 have a context in, in the way God was, was dealing and working with the nation of Israel during His earthly ministry, and then you come down to verse 5, and He says that He's not put in subjection, uh, uh, that the angels have not been in put in subjection to the world to come, whereof He's what? So is the writer here talking about something that is in the future? You following that? James, come over to James. There's way more we could say about Hebrews, okay? And we'll, we'll say more about it as we work through the material. But for now, we're just, we're just doing kind of an overview here. <clears throat> James 1.1. 1, 1. James 1.1, 1, 1, what's it say? James, servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the church, the body of Christ, ascended in heavenly places. Right? No. James, servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to who? The twelve tribes, notice, which are what? So whenever James is writing and addressing the twelve tribes, have they already been what? Scattered. But who is he, who's, who's he addressing? Israel. Was James the leader of the Jerusalem Council meeting in Acts 15 and Galatians 2? Yep. And he says here that he's specifically writing to who? So folks, has something changed? Come over, let's look at a few more things. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Get 
Get that in one hand and get Exodus 19 in the other. Get James 2 in one hand and Exodus 19 in the other. James chapter, or, I'm sorry, did I say James? I meant 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Now, who's Peter? Peter is Peter one of the twelve? Is Peter one of the ones who at the Jerusalem Council meeting in, in Acts chapter 15 and written about by Paul in Galatians chapter 2 said that he would limit his ministry to the circumcision? Okay? So Peter's writing, and he says the following, Acts chapter, or 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, and holy nation. I forgot the priesthood. That was the most important part, and I forgot to read it. And ye are a chosen generation, a royal what? Priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who's he talking about? Come over to Exodus 19. Exodus chapter 19, look at verse 5. <clears throat> Exodus 19, 5. Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant... Then, you shall be what? You shall be what? Where did we just read about a peculiar treasure? First Peter, right? Uh, unto me, a peculiar treasure unto me, above, above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of what? Priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of who? Israel. So you come over to Peter, go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 9, and he says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Who's he talking to and about? Israel. He's quoting Exodus 19, which was clearly, we go back and read it, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. See, what Peter and the boys are doing here is they are preparing this generation to actually go in and become the kingdom of priests and the holy nation and the royal priesthood that God intended them to what? To be. You remember when we talked about water baptism? And we talked about in the Gospels what was really going on with water baptism and the whole reason why they had to be washed with water and anointed with oil and so forth was so that they could all function in the office of a what? Priest. So what's going on in 1 Peter is related to who? Israel. Come with me to um, let's look at a few more things. Come to 2 Peter. Come over to 2 Peter. Chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, this second, epi this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy, what? the holy prophets, and of the commandments of the apostles of the, Lord and, and sa of, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that they, shall, that they shall come in the what? There shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of us coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been, as they were from the beginning of the creation. You see how what Peter, you see how there in verses one and two and three he's addressing a group of people and he's saying you guys need to remember what the holy prophets was said would happen in Matthew chapter twenty four 
in the Olivet Discourse, they come and they say, what's going to be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? And, and he gives them all these instructions in Matthew 24. And he talks about how many shall come in my name. And, and he, he, he goes on down through there. It sounds very familiar when he says there in verse 3, know this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust. Their own lust. Is that going to happen? Look at Jude 17. <clears throat> but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles and of the Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after all an ungodly lusts. You see, you, do you see how these writers, they're not talking about new material. They're not talking about heretofore unknown material or material that had been kept a secret. They're talking about things that were either spoken by the prophets or that were spoken by the Lord and the apostles during His earthly ministry. And they're saying, you guys remember when He talked about these things? You need to remember those things because this is where you're at now. Revelation chapter 1. Again, it's overview. <coughs> Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show <clears throat> unto his ser servants things which, most, which must shortly come to pass. <clears throat> and he sent and signified it by his angel unto, unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. Blessed is he, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this what? Prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is what? Is at hand. Verse 5. For Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, notice, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Who is he going to make kings and priests unto his Father? The body of Christ or the nation of Israel? Exodus 19, if you keep the words of these commandments, I'll make you what? A kingdom of priests and a holy what? Nation. Look at verse 9. I, John, uh, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and, and heard... Behind me, a great voice as of a trumpet. And then he goes on to talk about the revelation that he received. But notice that he talks about the, day of the Lord's day or the day of the Lord. Is the day of the Lord part of the prophetic scripture? Yep. So what I'm trying to get you to see here is all, all this material from Hebrews, Hebrews and James and, and 1st and 2nd Peter and 1st, 2nd and 3rd John and Jude and Revelation, these final books of the Bible... They are dealing with a group of people that is going to see the culmination of the prophetic scriptures. That are going to have to live through the darkest days that the planet will ever see. That are going to have to face the adversary. That are going to be persecuted by the adversary. That are going to have to go through what the, what the prophetic writer Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's what? Trouble. And all of this material in these books is written from the perspective of that group of people that is going to need to know how to think, how to function, how to behave, as they're faced with dealing with this. And one of the, one of the ministries of God the Holy Spirit was to instruct them in these things. And so the Holy Spirit came and by inspiration led the writer of Hebrews and James and Peter and John 
to write things to the nation of Israel about the time of trouble that they are going to have to face. Now, Hebrews and Revelation, Hebrews through Revelation, excuse me, in Hebrews through Revelation, the time past distinction between Israel and the Gentiles has been reinstated and the middle wall is back up. Okay? Now we already, James chapter 1, verse 1. James for the 12 tribes, which are what? Scattered abroad. Go to 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Now folks, don't, don't get tripped up by this. When God set Israel aside and ended time past, was He dealing with the world on the basis of that distinction between circumcision and uncircumcision? so that He could deal today in the dispensation of grace in the but-now time period with all of humanity without what? Distinction. So if He's going to bring to fruition out here what He promised them back there, does that old state of affairs have to be reinstituted? Or reinstated? Okay? 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Come over to come over to chapter two. Well, you know we don't have to read chapter two because you already know that he's writing to those who are the chosen generation, the royal priest of the holy nation. He's writing to who? He's writing to the nation of Israel. Come to Revelation chapter two. Come back to Revelation. Look at chapter two. Verse nine. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are what? Jews, but are sorry, and are not. But are of the synagogue of who? Is there an advantage in the ages to come to being a Jew again? Was there an advantage in time past in being a Jew? Come to chapter 7 of Revelation. Everybody's got all kind of ideas about the 144,000. Goofy, crazy stuff. Okay? The Bible tells you who they are. Look at what it says. Verse 3. Revelation 7, 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and, they were, and there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all tribes of the children of who? So good. Who are they? They're Israelites. The 144,000 are sealed members of the nation of who? Israel. Verse 5, of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Reuben 12,000, uh, of the tribe of Gad were 12,000. You know, you, you go on down the list, right? Verse 8, of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Joseph, and so on. When the 144,000 are sealed, they're not Gentiles, they're not random people, they're all members of what nation? 12,000 out of every what? Tribe. And by the way, can these boys get hurt during the time of the tribulation? Shake your head, no, they can't. Why would he do that? Because if he didn't do it, it doesn't it say that except those days be shortened, there should no flesh what? Survive? And if he's going to have a remnant that makes it through to go on into the kingdom, is he, is he doing something here with respect to Israel to ensure that it happens the way he told them it would? Okay? Now, I forgot what we were going to do next. <clears throat> so when we last saw God deal with Israel as a nation, Stephen saw Christ standing at the right hand of God, the Father, thereby indicating that the time had arrived for him to make his foes his footstool or to deal with them in judgment and wrath. You remember that? Stephen looks up steadfastly into heaven in Acts 7 and he sees, he sees the glory of God 
uh, and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father and so forth, Acts 70 of the stoning of Stephen here, okay? And what does God do as a result? He sets the nation of Israel aside. He renders them an unbelief. And then what He does is He ushers in the but now time period here, okay? He reveals the what? The mystery. He reveals that to Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And the mystery pertains to the body of what? Of Christ, okay? And, and this is the, the, dispens, the dispensation of what? Of grace. And so the dispensation of grace one day is going to end as the Lord descends from heaven with a shout and He catches away the church, the body of Christ, to meet Him where? In the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord, right? And after that happens, what, after that happens, you're right back to where you were before what? Before He set Him aside. And before He set Him aside, did they have the spiritual advantage? And so when the, when the heretofore, when the heretofore unknown, unprophesied time period is over, and He takes the body of Christ out, the only thing left on the time period is for Him to fulfill everything that He promised to Israel. And so thus, in the Word of God, you have Paul's epistles in here, you have Romans through Philemon uh, in here, the church is taken out to meet the Lord in the air, and then you immediately have a shift to the book of what? And I can't spell and write at the same time. You have the book, you have Hebrews through Revelation, where once again you see God dealing with the world on the basis of a distinction between who? Israel and who? The Gentiles. And those books are about the way God's going to deal with those people in that time to come. Now, I'm running out of time, which I know you're not surprised about. So instead of the last days of instead of the last days of prophecy being executed upon Israel here, God does something that no one in all of the universe anticipated. He reveals a what? A mystery. He does something that Satan and his cohorts, that the Israelites, that the fathers of time past prophecy had no idea about. God does something so dramatic, so different from what the prophetic time frame said He should have done, He ushers in this time period here. So when this time period comes to an end, you're going to be back where you were here, aren't you? Now, and I have it in parentheses for a purpose. So instead of the last days of prophecy being executed upon Israel and the nations, they were interrupted. They were suspended and temporarily placed on hold on account of the revelation of the mystery and the formation of the body of Christ. So according to Daniel's prophetic time schedule, there is only one time frame that remains yet unfulfilled. Come back to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. i got five minutes, and I think I can do this in five minutes. Don't laugh. Daniel 9.27, okay? Seventy weeks are determined upon who? Who's that? That's Israel. And upon who? The holy city. What's that? Jerusalem, okay? So look at the verse, verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. What's the first word after city? To finish the what? Transgression. So, by the end of these 70 weeks, by the end of this period of 490 years, the following six things will be accomplished. Read verse 24. To finish transgression. Number one. To make an end of what? Sins. Number two. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Number three. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Number four. To seal up the vision and prophecy. Number five. And to anoint the most holy. Number six. Okay? So at the end of this, at the end of this 70 weeks, the purpose of the 70 weeks that are determined upon the people and the city are to accomplish those six things ending with the most holy being what? Anointed. Okay? Everybody understand what that's saying? 
All right? <clears throat> then you have verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. We've talked about all that stuff in detail already. The street shall be built again and even the wall in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be what? So folks, has the 69th week ended before the Lord is crucified? The 69th week has ended because he's crucified after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be what? Shall Messiah be cut off? So if, that, if the 69th week ends before the cross, and then you have Acts 1, and you have this one-year time period, this extension of mercy that he gave Israel between Acts 2 and Acts 7, and they refused the offer of the kingdom during this one-year extension of mercy, then he, then he uh, forms the church, the body of Christ, something he didn't say. This, all of this stuff, as I tried to show you last week, happens in a gap in Daniel's what? Prophecy. So just because, I don't care what the Thief in the Night movie says, I don't care what the uh, Left Behind books say, just because the Lord Jesus Christ might catch us our way to meet Him in the air in ten minutes, doesn't mean the Antichrist will be revealed by lunchtime. Okay? Every Christian novel, Christian movie, they all show the Lord catching away the church and bang, the tribulation starts the next nanosecond. Okay? Because all of this fits within a what? A gap in Daniel's prophecy. In verse 26, some stuff happens. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. One of them is the crucifixion of Christ, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are what? Determined. There's some stuff happening there. Then look at verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? Okay, well if 69 weeks have run their course, how many are left? One. And I'm running out of space. But the one week that is left is referred to as the 70th what? week. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. When does the starting of the 70th week count? Or when does the starting of the, when does the counting of the 70th week begin? Look at verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? What begins it? There's a signing of some sort of a what? Covenant. Between Israel and someone. And notice in verse 26 that between the 69th week and the 70th week, even in Daniel's prophecy, there's some stuff going on. There's this, Pete, there's this prince that's going to come. He's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? One week. What starts the counting of the 70th week is the signing of this covenant between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel. We'll talk more about this in more detail next week. Okay? But there's some sort of war going on, and Israel thinks that their best option is to sign a what? The covenant. Read the rest of verse 27 and we'll close. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to what? Now, this week is how many years? Seven years. So if it happens in the middle, if something happens in the middle of the week, that means this time period is divided between two periods of three and a half what? Years. Verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it what? Desolate. Now, we don't have time to look at it, but Matthew chapter 24, the Lord Jesus Christ in the Olivet Discourse says, 
that when you shall see the abomination of, the de of desolation spoken by the prophet of Daniel, flee. Remember that? The abomination of desolation happens when? In the midst, in the middle. Okay? So when you're thinking about these things, you have to understand there's a definite point where the, where the counting starts that this is divided between three and a half and three and a half, and there's, th there's different things that are going to happen during this period that are going to happen in this period, and there's something major that's going to happen in the middle It's going to cause things to change, and that's called what the Bible calls the abomination of desolation. Okay? Now, when these, go back to verse 24, at the, when all this stuff is accomplished, the last thing that's going to happen at the end is the anointing of who? At the end of this time period, who's going to return from heaven? The Lord Jesus Christ can return a second coming. You're going to have the battle of Armageddon, and then you're going to have the establishment of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, thereby fulfilling Israel's prophetic promise all the way back there to the Old Testament prophets. Okay? Now that's an overview. Because I know now you have more questions. But what I want you to see this morning is that Hebrews through Revelation direct your attention back to the prophetic covenant relationship that Israel has with, the, with, with God the Father and that the things that are going to transpire from there out are pertaining to a group of people that are going to have to live through the 70th week. And so what, these, what this information is out here are instructions for those people that are going to have to go through this time of untoward suffering, and wrath. Okay? I feel like that's not a good place to stop, but that's where we're stopping. So what we're going to do next week is we're going to begin to talk about this time period here, and for lack of a better term, the career of the man of sin. Okay? The only Father, I thank you once again for your word and for the saints that have come out here, your word preached. We pray, Lord, that we would have clarity from your word about these things, that we'd be cautious to not overanalyze and fall into the trap of date setting, to fall into the trap of headline reading and assigning verses to headlines in the newspaper, that we'll understand and we'll keep fixed in our mind that what we are talking about lies in the future, and it deals with your prophet, the culmination of your prophetic scriptures as they relate to the nation of Israel, not to the church the body of Christ. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.